Okay. <laughs> yeah, we can leave that. <clears throat> well, George, the bare 73 to nothing route of the Washington Redskins back in 1940 is certainly one of the most talked about games in the history of professional sport. What do you recollect about the psychological buildup for that game? What happened once it got underway? Oh, it was very simple, Jack. Three weeks before that playoff game, I, the New York, the Washington Redskins defeated us 70 to, seven to three. Uh -huh. And whereas we should have won that game because I'm the... Hold it. Let's start this one over. Well, George, that 73 to nothing Bears route of the Washington Redskins back in 1940 certainly is one of the most talked about sports events in history. What do you recollect about the psychological buildup for that game? And what happened once it got underway? Psychological buildup for that game, Jack, was very simple. In fact, it was non-existent because three weeks before that 73 to nothing game, the Washington Redskins defeated us seven to three on the questionable last play of the game when Sid Luckman threw a perfect pass to Bill Osmansky in the end zone. And that would have won the game for us. But the defensive halfback threw both his arms around Bill Osmansky's arms and the ball hit him in the chest and the umpire, the referee, did not call a penalty. Naturally, we screamed about this uh, lack of officiating. And, but you couldn't do anything about it because that was the last play of the game. The official blew the whistle and ran like the deuce for the dugout with me after him, but I never caught him. <laughs> but I did scream to the... Uh, fair to the sports writers and show them uh, the play uh, of the game. Uh, and as a result of that game, why George, my good friend George Marshall called us crybabies and a first half team. <laughs> naturally, in the build-up for that particular game, it was naturally all the players were furious, knowing uh, or we got cheated out of the game, and uh, it was just a matter of keeping them down, Jack, more than trying to uh, get them zeked up for the game. Well, sometimes a team can be too high. That is right, and that was my biggest problem. And I tried to play that down, and, and the pep talk before that game was of no consequence. All we had to do is repeat the fact that George Marshall called us crybabies, and then and even need that because they went up there, went out on the field really psyched up, and when at the uh, and the between halves, uh, all I said was, "Remember, fellas, uh, Marshall called us a first half team only, and that took care of everything." <laughs> So that was a, you can see, so it was an easy job on the part of the coaching staff to get the team psyched up for that game. Of course, you can't talk about the Bears and any particular rivalry without the Bears versus Green Bay. Now, your, your years with Lambeau had to be pretty interesting. Oh, they were. Curley was a great competitor and how he would get his team worked up for the Bears game. And though that was a great series, and it still exists today, Jack, I mean. So you can see what Curly Lambeau did for Green Bay uh -huh. and for, and also carried on later by Vince Lombardi and other great coaches. Are you happy with the alignment of the leagues as they are today? Well, we got to, no use complaining. We just got to take them as is. I could provide a better alignment if they'd listen to me. <laughs> Well, what are some of your viewpoints on that alignment? Well, you see, uh, all teams in our division are in the cold north, as they say. Mm -hmm. If they would revolve around some teams with, in the south or the west, why, that would help uh, playing conditions. But all of that will be done away with when we get a new stadium. All right, let's talk about that new stadium. By what year do you think Chicago will have a new stadium that one oh. you wanted for so long? And what kind of a stadium do you envision? And where would you put it? That's a lot of questions, Jack. 
I've been talking about a new stadium for 11 years and have been working avidly for the last six, six years. So, Jack, this is my seventh year, and I hope that it's our lucky year. And I think we will get a stadium in this year. Start the construction of one of these. Do you think it'll be within the city limits? Oh, Jack, we have one location in the city, which I hope it will be, and two outside the city. George, uh, now that you're in your 80th year, to what do you attribute this youthful outlook you have on life? You're at the office early, you work long hours, there's just no way you could ever get back and uh, play golf for a living, is there? I don't know, Jack, because it's, I think it all revolves around the state, statement that, uh, that this attorney Nader make. Nothing is work unless you'd rather be doing something else. And I'd rather be working on behalf of the Bears than anything else I know. And uh, that's been my philosophy, and I've lived it, and I like it. If I may be permitted a personal note here, George, after all, you and I have been friends for a lot of years now. And uh, you mentioned about your philosophy. I have to think that among all the people I have known, uh, uh, included in your philosophy, heavier than most anybody I can think of are such words as loyalty and guilt edge bond word. In other words, if George Hallis gives his word on a deal, tell the lawyers not to bother to draw up the contract. It's a deal. And I've seen too many demonstrations of your loyalty not to know that that's important. Well, thank you very much, Jack. It's nice of you to say that, and I appreciate it. But uh, another part, I always try to be considered of the other fellow. That, to me, is always important. Are you sure the officials in the NFL would agree with that statement? <laughs> I was only trying to help them out. They just missed out on the rules. And I was just trying, I was just trying to point out the rules. But one of the greatest officials in the league was this Bill Downs. He was just tremendous. He's the one man that I never screamed at during his enti my entire uh, football coaching while he was officiating. He was a great one. Of course, we had a lot of other good officials, too. Shorty Ray is a name that probably is not very well known today, but to you and to me, Shorty Ray is a pretty important name in pro football. A great name. I was uh, chairman of the Rules Committee, and I realized how much work there is to it, because if you change one rule here, there are a dozen other places in the books that you've also got to change. So I asked Shorty Ray to help me. And then I finally talked Bert Bell into making him uh, the rules chairman sure for the National the Football League. And he rewrote all the rules of the National Football League, made them sharper, clear, and he did a tremendous job. He also taught the officials, also was in charge of the officials, of instructing the officials. Jack, we owe Shorty Ray a great debt of, uh, of gratitude. Yes, he was a little mathematics teacher in, in Chicago. Yeah, at Harrison High School. Yeah. And uh, I remember you're telling me one time while he was still around, he said up until now he's been good for about 55 rule changes that I can think of in pro football. Well, it was all a matter, of, uh, Jack, of clarifying with him. You see. What about such things as the reserve clause, the Roselle rule? Do you, uh, are you satisfied with them? Do you think there's some changes would make sense there? We've gone along pretty good for a long time, which has been great for the members of the league and great for the players. And there's, I see no reason why any of those rules should be changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it won't. It might harm the. It might harm some of the owners, but on the other hand, it's going to hurt the players a great deal more. You mean uh, if they uh, eliminate the Roselle rule or? That's right. Mm -hmm. Uh, in other words, from a clear-cut, well-organized league, you're going to run into some shambles on some part of the procedure. Well, since 1920, George, you've seen a few major changes take place in this sport. Yes, we have. Would you say that it's 
Uh, did you envision it being ever this big? No, of course not, Jack. I knew we had a great product on the basis of uh, Coach Zupke's statement plus the fact of the first couple of years in the game. We had a great product. But to think, uh, well, and you know what a shot in the arm was when Mike Grange uh, came into it. He gave us such wide spread uh, exposure. And, but I never thought it'd come to this. Did you ever think a franchise would be worth a million dollars, perhaps? No, I didn't, Jack. No, I didn't. I, uh, I knew I started to make a pretty good living. And I always had to go to the bank to be able and get a loan to, uh, to be able to start the team off for the following season. And it, was on, it wasn't until 1959. It was the first year that I didn't have to go to the bank. George, so a God bless you. George, what do you best recall about that original conversation about pro football on the running board back in Canton, Ohio, some 55 years ago? Yes, that's right, Jack. Back in September 17th, 1920, why we met in, in Ralph Hayes' automobile showroom. I don't remember what car. It was probably the Hupmobile. But anyway, we did have a meeting there which embodied 11 teams. And we elected Jim Thorpe as our first president. And Stan Kofall, as I remember, was the secretary. And also Frank Need and Art Ranney was, sec was uh, treasurer. And I remember our first order of business was to elect officers, which we did. And then the next thing was to fix the fee to become a member of this football league. And it was $100. And uh, it was worth it, Jack. <laughs> Yeah. And the last franchise that we've heard about now in pro football went for how many million? Maybe uh, I think it was 18. Eight, I think it was 18 million, yeah. So there's been a, sort of a, an increase in the fee. <laughs> who called the meeting? How did it happen to come about anyway? Well, Ralph Hay, who owned the Kansas, uh, Canton Bulldogs, he called the meeting uh, for Canton, Ohio, in his automobile showroom. Who was he? Oh, he was a great football fan, and he owned the Canton Bulldogs. And he was an enthusiastic fan and, uh, and also owner. And uh, he certainly started us off in the right direction. I remember you telling me one time, George, how maybe the idea for professional football was born in your mind when Bob Zupke at Illinois made the statement that just as you fellows learn how to play football, I lose you. Well, that's what impressed me with the idea that a fellow get, just getting out of college is ready for the game because he, during his four years in college, he's learning the game under great coaches. And then when he gets out of school, he's ready to apply what he earned, what he learned under these coaches mm -hmm. and to continue on to become great players. Who were some of the cities represented in those original franchises? Well, of course, the Canton Bulldogs the Akron Pros, the Massillon Tigers, the Cleveland Indians, and you can see that was all centered around in Ohio. Uh -huh. And then, of course, the Chicago Cardinals and the Rock Island Independents and Doc Hammond Pros and uh, Chris O'Brien's Cardinals and the Staley team of Decatur. Now, the Staley team of Decatur, of course, was the forerunner of the Chicago Bears. That's right. How long were you the Decatur Staley before you became the Chicago Bears? Well, we had a great season in 1920 because we were the first team to pl practice every day. And that's the reason we were able to have a great team and won most of the games. Was it because, in the case of the other teams, these fellows had jobs during the week? That's right. Uh -huh. Here we did have, they all had jobs with the Staley Company, and I uh, talked Mr. Staley in getting uh, the players two hours a day off uh, for practice, mm -hmm. and that enabled us to have a great team, and that did start everyday practice by the other teams. How much of your own money did you invest in pro football originally? Gee, strange as it may seem, Jack, the Staley Company furnished a $100 fee and uh, it didn't cost me a penny. At the end of the 1920 season, Mr. Staley called me in and he said, we're in a recession and we cannot afford to have a 
team in 1921. I would like to give you $5,000 for you to take the team uh, to Chicago and call at the Chicago Staley's for one year, which we did. So you can see, Jack, I was paid to get into this wonderful game. <laughs> Was the idea of moving to Chicago his idea, George, or yours? Oh, uh, well, naturally mine, because that was the only place to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we played at Wrigley Field. I made a deal with Mr. Vec, a wonderful man, uh, for the rental of Wrigley Field, which we did until a few years ago. I thought I read one time where when you <coughs> played your first game at Wrigley Field, you took the first $20 that came ac across the ticket window and went across the street to buy tape to tape your ball club. Well, that was Andy Lockshaw's story, and it was always a good one, so we let it set. <laughs> well, what about the expenses of a ball club in those days, though, George? Uh, did you break even from the very beginning, or did you run in the hole? Well, we had a salary limit, Jack, of uh, $1,800 for an 18-man squad. That was the limit. How many games? And, and uh, well, we would have about, a, about 12 to 14 games even then. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky to play break even. I know Dutch Sterneman, I took him in his partner and figured uh, it would save money. And uh, he got $100 for coaching and playing, and I got $100 for coaching and playing. And that's how we started until Red Grains joined us in 1925. There was a man that really gave pro football the great, the great impetus. He was such a widely advertised player and a great player. And uh, I remember that our first game at Wrigley Field in Thanksgiving in 1925, why we filled it to capacity in every other game. Later on at that time, our game was drawing about ten to 20,000. But then when we went to New York, why, uh, with Red, why we drew 65,000 into the polo grounds, 5,000 more than the previous week in, uh, for the Army-Navy game. I've heard a lot of stories about the dickering between you and Red's manager, C.C. Uh, Pyle. That must have been a very interesting two or three days when you fellows were lashed up together in well, that hotel. That's here. right, Jack. And with it, it was a lot of fun because uh, uh, C.C. Pyle, Cash and Carry Pyle, he was a he was a movie magnet from Champagne. He owned a couple of movies down there. <laughs> that made him a magnet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in those days. <laughs> but he was great to negotiate with. We enjoyed it, and we stayed up all night and finally arrived at the necessary uh, figure. Because whereas he got, whereas Red Grange got a percentage of the gate, which was perfect. Can you tell us a little more of the details of that arrangement? With Red? Mm -hmm. And with Pyle? Were there, what were the principal hang-ups? Money? Uh, percentage of the gate, that was the main thing, which was all right, because Red ended up with, a, with a, I think it was 40 to 50 percent of the gate, and in view of the fact that he was attracting he was a great attraction mm -hmm. uh, because every park we played in, uh, it was filled to capacity. Yes, you played, what, something like 14 games in 18 days or something like that? Well, that's when we started out, Jack, originally to make this great tour trip to the east, and we came back, and then we started on a trip to uh, Florida, New Orleans, and uh -huh. the West Coast. The game itself, George, what would you say are among the principal changes in pro football since it all began in the 20s? Well, what we had going for us in the 20s was the great bursting enthu enthusiasm of the players. Mm -hmm. you know, their genuine liking for the game and also uh, the bruise contact. And that hasn't changed. That still exists today. That's what attracted a lot of people uh, to our game. And I, I think uh, that was the greatest impetus that we could possibly get out of the game as long as we could be exposed to the public, which Red Grange furnished us. That's the reason I say the Red Grange gave the, gave the greatest impetus to professional football. Of course, George, as you pointed out, the ballpark was full for that first appearance by Grange at Wrigley Field in Chicago. But 
In those days, I would imagine the press agentry was a little bit on the informal side. Uh, how did you how did you get publicity? We didn't have to seek it. They seeked us. Strange it may seem at that time. Every place we go, why it was automatically headlines, eight column headlines. What about before Grange came into it? Oh, that was a little different story. We had to go around and write our own stories, deliver them to the papers. They didn't send out any writers in those days. Mm -hmm. And we would get two to three inches right next to the pat patent medicine ads. <laughs> so it was a tough, it was a tough haul. <laughs> but we knew we had the product. That we're sure of. The, somebody said the Chicago Tribune gave a banner headline uh, on their sports section following the first appearance by Grange, and that was probably the first official big-time recognition that pro football got. Well, it was. It was Don Maxwell at that time was a sports editor, and I uh, proceeded to thank Don Maxwell for giving us the eight-column line. He said, George, he said, I didn't do it for you. I did it for the paper. We had nothing to read on Monday morning. There was nothing to print about sports on Monday morning. And this was a natural for the papers. And he was so right. Hey, this is super. This is, uh, is perfect. You too. I want to see if we well, can do a little job for that stadium. Huh? See if we can do a little job for that stadium. Yeah, there won't be much. Yeah. George, you told me one time about the most important pass, forward pass, you ever experienced in the early days. Let's have it. With the suitcase, with the money? Oh, that's uh, when we were in Rock Island, Jack. And when we played there, we insisted on getting the guarantee of $3,000 before the game. Because there's some question in those days whether you got your money after you played the game. And we did, have the, did get the $3,000 in cash, and we had it on the bench. And uh, right after the game, I knew they were after us, and we <laughs> climbed in the cab, and bricks started coming through the cab windows. I said, here, George, take this and beat it, because uh, they were mainly after him. And he did take the money and beat it, and he picked up. Uh, he, he was very fortunate in getting a car that was going over to Davenport, because we stayed in the Davenport Hotel. Didn't dare stay in Rock Island. Never dare stay in Rock Island. And that night on the sleeper, why I got the money and put it, uh, put it in my sock, and I took the upper berth and put it in my pillowcase. I, I learned that the, uh, the, uh, the reason for putting it in the sock was very important. And I learned the lesson the hard way. When I was uh, with the, had my cup of coffee with the New York Yankees, we traveled in 1919 from Washington to Boston. And uh, when we arrived in Boston, I'd put my wallet 
in the pillowcase. And when we arrived in Boston, I was in a hurry to get off, and I got off, get off the train, and, and I told Truck Hand, our catcher, I said, gee, I left my wallet in, in the pillowcase. He said, well, they'll call ahead to the main station. But he said, let me tell you one thing. Whenever you got money to put in the pillowcase at night, first put it in your sock and then put it in the pillowcase, and which I did for the next 50 years. <laughs> and I never forgot my wallet after that. <laughs>